bring this piece this morning to acknowledge that these lands that we love are the ancestral lands of the Yavapai people, the Wipukepas, the Tolkepayas, the Kwevkepayas, and the Yavapai. We also, since we are celebrating 25 years, and I've seen some faces come in I haven't seen for a while, I wonder if anyone could stand who's been with us for these 25 years. Could you please stand if there's anyone who's been here from the beginning? <laughs> this morning at around five, I woke up and went out onto our deck, the air around me cool and fragrant, the sky becoming lighter and lighter, and I could hear the sounds of crickets singing and all manner of chirping, the whirr of a hummingbird in flight, the pale orange of the sunrise spreading from the east. Let us listen now to how the sun rose in another part of this land, Sonora morning.
Good morning, that was lovely. What a way to begin this service. My name is Jack Wood. I'm the worship associate today, and I welcome you all to Granite Peak, all of you here. And we have a pretty full room today. And I think we have a number of people in our uh, Zoom audience. And um, I'm glad you're here. Welcome on this Labor Day weekend. It's Labor Day weekend. I, I wonder, is this the last holiday weekend of the summer or the first one of the fall? I can never remember. I guess it doesn't make a difference. We should just celebrate it. And I think that we should remember to think about all those people, all those working people that help to make our lives livable. The farm workers and the factory workers, the truckers, the computer programmers, the healthcare workers, and the restaurant staff, and even the people in the churches, I guess. So, um, you know, this weekend, remember them. Um, welcome again to Granite Peak of Prescott, Arizona. And uh, we're online, our, our Zoom services are online. Uh, we are a very active congregation, and September is a very busy month for us every year, and this September is especially so. We have so many things going on, and we hope that all of you will be interested in participating and sharing the events that are uh, scheduled for this month. Next Sunday, there's going to be a, a very special event um, called Songs of the Earth, an outdoor concert at Watson Lake in Prescott at the Upper Ramada. It's going to be at 5 p.m. on Sunday the 11th. Uh, there is no charge to attend this, but uh, you're asked to bring a folding chair so we'll have a place to sit. And it's going to be a special coming together of members of our choir, um, singers from Trinity Presbyterian, and singers from the Church of Latter-day Saints. So it promises to be a wonderful event. It's inspired by the beauty of the earth, and certainly the first selection today about the Sonoran reflections uh, was ample evidence of what's to come. Uh, in addition, uh, this month is Empty Bowls Month for Granite Peak and for Prescott Unitarian Fellowship and for the Prescott community. Uh, Empty Bowls is a long tradition of helping to feed the hungry in our community. And um, we've been doing it since 1997. Uh, I moved here in 1999, and I remember that first Empty Bowls event. It's, it's always an amazing event. I had prepared really well this morning by typing out my welcome announcement and customizing it for today, and it's sitting on my printer at home. So I'm kind of winging this a bit, but oh well. Um, a little bit later in September, um, Granite Peak will be involved with the International Day of Peace Gathering at Prescott Courthouse Square on September 21st. There's more information to come on that. So, oh, there's also a movie this week on September 6th, which I believe is Tuesday at 5 p.m. here in the, Granite, in the Granite Peak Sanctuary. Disturbing the peace. Sounds like something we do. So, I think I've covered most of the announcements that I wrote about. If I didn't, well, forgive me. Um, we will do the chalice lighting now. And I'm gonna ask Art Gorski to be our chalice lighter this morning. And we usually have a pretty standard prayer, if you will, when we light the chalice, but today we have a special one. And this one was written almost 30 years ago in 1993 by one of the founding members of Granite Peak, Judy Davis. And I tried to reach Judy, but I wasn't able to get through to her. Um, I'm not sure whether she wrote this originally or whether somebody else wrote it and she copied it down. But here it is. O higher power, which art within us, strengthen be thy force. Our courage come, our work be done, 
on earth, for here is heaven. Give us this day a clearer vision and forgive us our shortcomings as we forgive those who sell us short. Lead us not into complacency, but deliver us from selfishness. For ours are the challenges and the risks and the joys forever in this world. Ah, love. Good morning. You are a beautiful sight, a beautiful sight. We gather in this sanctuary after 25, and actually I think it's been 26, but on the cake you will have later, it says 25. So let's keep with 25. We gather in this sanctuary made holy by all the human events that we have shared together in this place, births, deaths, illnesses, and inspiration that has pushed us out on the streets to action. We are here today. We are showing up on Zoom, and I see Judy Davis on Zoom, who's waving, and she was a founding member who wrote those words. We are here surrounded by our principles, etched by Johanna Hawley, serenaded by our choir. This is an auspicious time to look ahead and look behind and see that we did climb that mountain and that the view stretches around us to the horizon. We can see Granite Peak, Thumb Butte, Mingus Mountain, and the sacred San Francisco peaks. And if we squinted, could we see the Grand Canyon gaping below? Let us rise together in body or spirit and sing, enter, rejoice, and come in. Number 361 in the gray hymnals. covenant together. Love is the doctrine of this congregation. The quest for truth is sacrament, and service is its prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge in freedom, to serve others in community. Thus do we covenant together.
Let us breathe here together and on Zoom. I see so many friends gathered here. And let us consider the many joys and sorrows that we bring with us to our life in community, into this sanctuary and into cyberspace that is coming to us. We each go through times in our lives that are difficult. And today we hold especially Ken Briefer, who is in hospice, Dan Reardon, who is mourning the death of his beloved Sandy. We also bring um, Daryl Levi's sorrow about his email that was hacked. And, the, um, and he apologizes to everyone and invites them to, to um, say bad things to him after the service if they so feel fit. For this is the awful side of technology, which I imagine many of us have a little bit of both sorrow and joy at technology in our hearts. I now invite all of you who are holding joys and sorrows that have a particular name to either write them in the chat and I will say them or to, to say the names out loud and I will repeat them to the people who are on Zoom so that we can feel that we are together through cyberspace. Are there any? Just a moment. Chris's friend, Tracy Jones. Tracy Jones. Yes, of course, Lee Phillips and Ed Rosage, who have COVID. Another sorrow going through our world. Yes. Yes. Sarah. Oh, Sarah's daughter who has COVID. Our friend Maria Elena, whose friend just died of COVID. We thought that had stopped. Yeah. And Sarah Mahler also says about a friend who is struggling with addiction which is indeed a sorrow that touches, I believe, all of our lives through family and friends. Any other, I, um, and somebody else wrote Lee and Ed, and I apologize for not remembering that at the beginning. And John Brown from, from Peter Eldridge. And Norma's son-in-law, Ron Kelly, and sister, Deb. I invite us now into a time of meditation. We have prepared bowls of water. Those of you who have not been here for a while, um, we're adopting something from Puff as we continue our collaboration with them. And um, I invite you to come up and put a stone in the water or two or three. Um, and those ripples of water will carry these joys and concerns or sorrows into our congregation and our hearts and the greater community so that we may be with you at this time. I invite you to come up during this time of music if you have something special to say, please come up and use this microphone. To 
all my friends who have seen me through a very difficult time in my life. And gratitude to the choir for their welcoming and uh, for having had the pleasure of singing with them. And our sorrow at Dorothy moving to a place where she has family down in the way south of Arizona. Jack, could you place two more stones? We place these two more stones for any joys and sorrows that are out there that have not been shared. And a final stone, so one more, Jack. For those who do not have a community in which to share these joys and sorrows, with the hope that they will find one. Again, let us breathe together. We come together at this auspicious time, grateful for those 25 years of perseverance, those 25 years of sharing one another's most difficult and most precious times. We give thanks for those who founded this community and brought this space where we could bring all that we are. Amen, and may it be so. And now let us sing, Walking, Walking With You. Now we come to the audience participation part of the program. The offertory. Um, the work of this church is important work and it demands a lot of human resources and spiritual resources and ultimately some financial resources as well. So give until it feels good. Thank you. And I should also put in a pitch for our special Seeds of Support group this month. It's Empty Bowls. Um, we will be having the Empty Bowls event in two Sundays on Courthouse Square. Um, people will be able to buy beautiful handcrafted bowls for $20 and get um, soup from local restaurants and bread from local bakeries and enjoy a wonderful community event. Uh, in addition, we also take a collection during the Sundays of this month um, for empty bowls as well.
Thank you very much for your financial support of this congregation. It is given in generosity as you see in gratitude. I'm going to read a, church, uh, a poem called Church Going by Philip Larkin. It's um, somewhat abridged. So here we go. <clears throat> Once I am sure there's nothing going on, I step inside, letting the door thud shut. Another church, matting, seats, and stone, and little books, sprawlings of flowers, cut for Sunday, brownish now, some brass and stuff up at the holy end, the small, neat organ, and a tense, musty, unignorable silence brewed God knows how long. <clears throat> Hatless, I take off my psycho clips in awkward reverence, move forward, run my hand around the font, from where I stand, the roof looks almost new, cleaned or restored. Someone would know, I don't. Mounting the lectern, I peruse a few hectoring large scale verses and pronounce, here endeth much more loudly than I meant. The echoes snigger briefly. Back at the door, I sign the book, donate an Irish sixpence, reflect the place was not worth stopping for. Yet stop I did, in fact I often do, and always end much at a loss like this, wondering what to look for. Wondering too, when churches fall completely out of use, what shall we do with them? If we keep a few cathedrals chronically on show, their parchment, plate, and picks in locked cases and let the rest rent free to rain and sheep? Shall we avoid them as unlucky places? But superstition like belief must die. And what remains when disbelief is gone? Grass, weedy pavement, brambles, buttress, sky, a shape less recognizable each week, a purpose more obscure. I wonder who will be the last, the very last, to seek this place for what it was. So long and, equ and equitably, what sense is found only in separation, marriage and birth and death and thoughts of these, for whom was built this special shell? It pleases me to stand in silence here. A serious house on serious earth it is, in whose blent air all our compulsions meet, are recognized and robed as destinies. And that much never can be obsolete. Since someone will forever be surprising a hunger in himself to be more serious, and gravitating with it to this ground, which he once heard was proper to grow wise in. Thank you, Jack. After 10 years of fighting and winning the Trojan War, and then 10 more years of being waylaid, Odysseus is alone. He's lost all of his soldiers who came with him from Ithaca. They died along the way because of the atro atrocities that they committed during that Trojan War that continued to anger the gods. As the Odyssey opens, Odysseus is stuck on the island of Calypso the captive of a beautiful goddess. When we see him for the first time, he is sitting on the beach and there are such paintings. 
He is sitting on the beach, looking out towards his home, the island of Ithaca, where his wife Penelope is waiting, not knowing whether he is alive or dead. And he is weeping sorely. Finally, Athena, a goddess who wants to help him return home, she gets him off that island. But another god, Poseidon, is so angry with Odysseus because he killed his son, the Cyclops, that Poseidon rescue, the Poseidon destroys his ship. So Odysseus is in the sea and he swims all night and day. And finally he is washed up on the shore of an island. He's naked and mangy and stinks, they say in the ancient Greek text. He doesn't look at all like that handsome warrior who took Troy, who took the, who, who was the one who won the victor of the Trojan War. Odysseus is simply a naked, stinky stranger in need of shelter. And the Phaeacians who occupy that island take him in. In this moment, in these hours that pass between when he is on shore and mangy and naked to when he is sitting at the dinner table with them, during these moments is enacted the ancient Greek custom of Xenia. The Phaeacians take him in because of Xenia. Classic scholar Emily Wilson, who wrote a marvelous translation of the Odyssey, writes that the Greek word Xenia means both hospitality and friendship. The cognate word Xenos can mean both stranger and friend. It is the root from which we get the English word xenophobia, the fear of strangers or foreigners, as well as the sadly less used word xenophilia, the love of strangers, the love of unknown objects. In ancient Greece, those who traveled to an unfamiliar land used the norms and expectations of Xenia to form bonds with people who might otherwise have treated them as too ragged and dirty to, re to deserve a welcome or as too dangerous to accept into their home. Xenia opens the doors of a palace to a stranger, a Xenos who's washed up on the shore. The hosts, who are also Xenos, prepare a bath, give him new clothing, food, and only after the guest has been properly taken care of can they ask the identity of that stranger. This sanctuary, has welcomed people who were living on the streets or in shelters. And we have welcomed judges and professors and artists and people who are searching for who they are and people who have spent time in prison and people who have spent time in palaces, I imagine. In my first years of ministry, I once looked out from a pulpit and I saw the congregation as beautiful driftwood from many different places. As in Xenia of ancient Greece, I believe that the deepest 
hospitality that I have felt has happened before people know who I am, before I could say things that would make myself respectable to them. It is a rare and marvelous experience to be respected simply as we are before we exchange business cards and awards. In this sanctuary and before that at the adult center and at a ballroom in one of the hotels, this congregation has welcomed people traveling through this area for a day, a week, and some have stayed for the entire time, like Judy Davis, who is on Zoom today. She and her husband, Ethan, came here as strangers, if you can imagine, but with long history as Unitarian Universalists in another place. And right at that time, Granite Peak was emerging from Prescott UU Fellowship. She and Ethan quickly transformed from stranger to friend. And I wonder about that word Zenos that encompasses both those meanings. This community has been a gathering place for Zenos, for both strangers and friends. And perhaps we are always both. Our lives give us opportunities to shift roles. We go away for a few years or all the, through the pandemic, and we return in many ways as strangers. Or perhaps we return after a long bout with an illness, such as a pulmonary embolism, or a stroke, or the death of a beloved, or even becoming a mother and all that entails brings to us new roles in need of a welcome. As a minister, I am often a stranger, someone who arrived here a little over three years ago. In, and in, I am in the role of welcoming those who have been here for every, almost every Sunday of 25 years. Our sanctuary and our community are places of shifting roles. There are so many stories, and I think that we learn a lot by listening to one story. Since the story of our congregation's 25 years is the story of individuals, here is a personal story by Reverend Sue Nauman about her encounter with us, not right at the beginning, but in the late 1990s. Let us welcome Reverend Sue Nauman. Good morning, everybody. It's sure good to be here. I haven't been here in so long. Um, it's good to be here. My spiritual journey both ended and began when I finally found a religious home here at Granite Peak. In those days, in the late 1990s, we met at the old senior center on Aubrey. Early on, this Presbyterian minister was asked to preach my first UU sermon. I entitled it a crack, wait a minute, gotta get this right, a crock pot kind of faith. Wait, the best is yet to come. The spell check kept changing it to crock pot to crack pot. And that seemed to fit just fine. Lena played the piano, and Randy Phillips, who's here today, was the worship leader. Granite Peak welcomed me, and I fell in love with this small, vital congregation. After years of pushing against the confines of Presbyterian theology, 
Now at Granite Peak, I could stop reeling and experience internal peace and shared values with this new spiritual community. In 2000, Granite Peak called the Reverend Dan Spencer as its first settled minister. For 13 years, Dan and I were friends, colleagues, and sometimes foes. He supported my becoming an affiliate minister of Granite Peak in 2002. This action enabled me to continue my ministry in an official Unitarian Universalist capacity. His children, Pearson and Garrett, his wife Beth and I became friends like an extended family. Years later, I also participated in his second marriage in an intimate setting at his home with Jordana's family and the boys. Together as a congregation, we bought a building right here, grew our membership, enjoyed both children's education and adult education. Women's groups, chalice circles, dinners for eight, brought us together in a tighter communion. We joined with Puff in supporting empty bowls and other fundraising projects. Faithfully, and sometimes painfully, we learned about and practiced social justice in the community right here and beyond. As a minister, I flourished. I preached from my heart, mind, and soul, never worrying about orthodoxy or being defrocked, so to speak. Puff and Sedona welcomed me often. I officiated at weddings and celebrations of life. There was no fear, only joy and the fullness of life. After a pulmonary embolism in 2012, I have been less active at Granite Peak. I needed to relearn how to walk without falling down, drive and focus. And my memory was gone. During that time, Dan left, and we had several ministers for shorter durations. And now we are blessed by Reverend Patty, who brings her many gifts and the fullness of her life to share with our Granite Peak community. With the addition of Zoom during the pandemic, I have been able to worship from a distance and re-engage in small ways with Granite Peak. A few weeks ago, the past and the present of my Granite Peak history collided. I went to Puff that morning to hear our very own Anna Fleury. The subject of her talk was grief. In the first few sentences, she told us about Pearson Spencer's suicide. From the midst of the small congregation, I yelled, no! I started to cry and then sob. I couldn't stop. I thought of Beth and Dan, their pain and their grief. Memories flooded my mind. That sweet young boy was dead. Anna was crying too. Pearson had been her friend since childhood. The congregation was stunned and we were a collective mess of shock and sadness. And then we all came together as one. We held each other. Our compassion and our grief melded the power of love in that room it's, was itself healing. And I knew in the depths of my being that we are and always have been a beloved community. Amen and thank you.
Thank you, Sue. Thank you. And I also give thanks for all of the stories out there, for each one is different from the other, and each is beautiful. And now we're going to return to Odysseus. We can't leave him with the Phaeacians. This war hero who lands naked on the island receives their wonderful Xenia. And after he's all cleaned up and dressed up and they ask, and he's had something to eat and they're, they're trying to get him to say his name, but he won't. He's very cagey about this. But in this scene, we start to understand that Odysseus is concerned. He's really wondering after all of these years, it's been 20 years since he left Ithaca, and it's been 10 years since he won the Trojan War. What are people saying about him? And in Greek, they would say, what is his kleos, kleos? How is he being remembered? Kleos in ancient Greek means fame or glory attained through good deeds and hard work. The heroes in ancient Greek tragedies strived to earn their kleos. Odysseus is only satisfied, and I imagine he was on pins and needles when he heard a bard sing after dinner about the Trojan War. And in that song, he lifts up Odysseus as a great hero. For Mary Lou and me, when we were studying the Odyssey, it made us both wonder, what would we want our Kleos to be? And I ask you, what do you want to, be want to be known for? And in our 25 years at Granite Peak, what are we known for? What are we known for? We have been courageous, and we are known for that because people tell ministers such things. We are known for being courageous in, our, in standing against racism. We have built a reputation on 25 years of co-sponsoring Empty Bowls with Prescott UU Fellowship. We are known for that. And I believe that being part of this community has been transformative. It has given many members and friends through the years a place to belong, a place to find comrades and to practice beloved community that Reverend Sue Nauman gave us a glimpse of in her words, and also to build up Kleos, Kleos that we can look back on with pride. I also think that the Kleos of Granite Peak has been written in many of our hearts that have recorded quiet moments, times of hospitality, when people reached out to us and they, those times are not written up in a newspaper. I also wonder, returning to the Odyssey, if the largest part of our Kleos will be our Xenia. I believe that our legacy and our future will be our hospitality. No matter what, we will be here meaningfully for another 25 years if we continue to practice the art of hospitality with each other and all through all the changes of our lives and with all who enter our doors. In Dewey last week, I talked with Randy and Blesta Phillips, and he spoke of his dream of, ex 
of an expanding congregation in the Quad City area. And I believe that Zania is how we will become that expanding congregation. I would also love to see more of that miracle of acceptance before we know the details of people's lives. Wait to hear anything about someone's life until you've shared some coffee and today cake. For 25 years, we have laughed and cried together. And we, as a community, will always be shifting roles from guest to host and back. These have been good years, and there are more ahead. And today, let us sit at the welcome table and celebrate. Amen. And may it be so. I invite you to rise in body or spirit, and we will sing together. We're going to sit at the welcome table. In the gray hymnal, it's number 407. sit at the welcome table we're gonna sit at the welcome table May we feel the love around us of 25 years of community building. May we honor the visible and invisible acts of kindness and courage that brought us to this place. May we continue to conjure that kindness and courage as we encounter new challenges together. May we open our arms to the stranger and may we receive the welcome that we need when we find ourselves to be strangers once again. Amen, and may it be so. And there's a postlude so everybody can, unless you want it, you're feeling good standing, but you may be seated. It's very short.
give thanks to Lena for how many years, Lena? <laughs> We're going to extinguish our chalice so that the people on Zoom can go to breakout rooms, but I want you to stay put because before the cake, we're going to greet our neighbors. Let us extinguish our chalice together. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Thank you everyone on Zoom, especially I'm looking at Judy, but I, and I can't see everyone, but all of you who came, all of you who came and all of your service through these many years. So now we enter the part of our service that is fully dedicated to Zania, who would have known it. So as our people on Zoom are finding each other in breakout rooms, I wonder, are there any out there who are visiting, who've not been introduced, or who are back after a long time, who would like to be introduced? This is the time. <laughs> 